Larry Porter Chisholm was born on December 19, 1948, in the small town of Forest City, Arkansas, about 45 miles southwest of Memphis, Tennessee. At the time, Forest City had a population of around 10,000, and was nicknamed the Jewel of the Delta, despite what the origins of its actual name would imply. After all, Forest City was named after Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest, who would go on to be elected as the first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, a legacy that continues to loom large over the town itself. Larry Chisholm would grow up in Forest City under the supervision of his parents, Millard and Francis Chisholm, who also had two other sons, John and Harry. Larry was known by all to be rather bookish, even somewhat nerdy, and he would achieve high marks throughout high school. Following his graduation, he began to attend Memphis State University, where he began to grow into his rather lanky frame. Here, he made the acquaintance of several people that would later be associated with him, including another young man named William Hinson, who was a fellow student at MSU. The two became fast friends and even lived together for a spell while away at school. In this time period, Larry also fell in love. Love that did not last long. The woman's name was Harriet. She and Larry would have two children together, both daughters, who were born in 1969 and 1970, respectively. The daughters were not ever really close with their father, as Harriet, their mother, divorced Larry pretty early in their lives and relocated them out of state. As the 1960s came to a close, Larry Chisholm was a young man just entering adulthood. He was a college student living in Memphis, Tennessee, who had just recently married and had had two daughters. But in 1970, the year that his second daughter was born, Larry was drafted into the U.S. Army, which was currently engaged overseas in the long-lasting Vietnam War. He would serve in the Army for the next two years, spending time in Vietnam, before receiving an honorary discharge in 1972. Following this discharge, he returned to Memphis, and enrolled once again at Memphis State University, where his smart and charismatic nature seemed to be moving him forward in life. At this point, Larry Chisholm was known as an incredibly intelligent young man, who seemed poised to achieve great things in life. He was already well on his way to earning his law degree at Memphis State University, but things would soon come to light that would permanently cancel those plans. Larry was just weeks away from his graduation in 1974, when he was arrested and charged with a litany of crimes. In addition to armed robbery, he was also alleged to have possessed and sold illegal narcotics, namely heroin, in mass quantities over a prolonged period of time. It turns out that there was much more to Larry than met the eye. While his outward appearance and bookish nature allowed him to go through life uninterrupted, he had covertly been operating a drug enterprise, which he was the ringleader of. While at school, Larry had recruited fellow students to help carry out this operation. Many of those accomplices were just teenagers, who had been chosen to smuggle heroin across the US-Mexico border. Their lives were now permanently impacted by this decision to partake in Larry's operation, but they would not be the last whose lives he would influence. Later that year, Larry Chisholm was sentenced to 40 years in prison for the creation of this drug ring. Normally, this is where the story would end. After all, for many, a 40-year sentence is a guarantee of a life wasted. But for Larry Chisholm, this was merely a setback. You see, his conviction, which came about in a Memphis courthouse in July of 1974, that is where our story begins. Over the next few years, Larry Chisholm would lie low inside of prison. There, he let his naturally charismatic and rather unassuming nature guide him, blending into the background of the prison population. He had even started to curry favor with the prison staff, who appreciated his earnestness in peacefully resolving conflicts between the guards and his fellow inmates. He had even joined the staff of the prison newspaper, The Phoenix, and seemed to be settling into a nice routine while incarcerated. Prison staff believed that Larry's amiable nature was part of a ploy to perhaps gain favor and apply for early release. To them, he seemed like a young man trying to make the best of a bad situation. But 
Larry had other plans, which began to unfold roughly four years after his incarceration. On September 13th, 1978, a Wednesday, Larry was one of more than 30 inmates allowed a reprieve from their monotonous prison life. They were allowed to have a supervised trip to a nearby bowling alley not too far away from the prison, the Bowl Arena in Dixon, Tennessee. There, they would be closely monitored by a handful of armed guards, but they were allowed to get out and stretch their legs and enjoy themselves for at least a few hours. This outing seemed to be going well for a time, but at some point, Larry started heading to the men's room, and another inmate followed him. They seemed to have picked up suspicious packages which they were carrying in their arms, and this caught the attention of a correctional officer. This was the beginning of Larry Chisholm's long-awaited plot, which had been planned out weeks, if not months, in advance. Earlier that day, William Hinson, Larry Chisholm's longtime friend who had once been his college roommate, had made a trip of his own to the bowl arena. There, he had planted a few firearms near the men's bathroom, a pair of sawed-off shotguns, to be exact. He had visited Larry in prison multiple times during his incarceration and had helped come up with this plan, eventually hiding the weapons in a place that only Larry would think to search. Now, hours later, Larry and a fellow inmate had grabbed a hold of the weapons and were hoping to begin their escape by arming themselves in the men's bathroom. The correctional officer, who noticed this bizarre activity, began following Larry and the other inmate into the bathroom. As the guard entered the bathroom, though, Larry surprised the man by leveling a shotgun at his head. Thankfully, there was no round in the chamber, and the guard was able to back up. He slammed the bathroom door against Larry and fell back into the main area of the bowling alley, where he pulled out his service weapon and prepared for violence. Armed with shotguns, Larry and his accomplice began engaging in a shootout with correctional officers, who struggled to gain control of the situation. One of the COs would be shot by Larry in this maelstrom, once in the chest, where he was saved by his bulletproof vest, and then another time in the arm. The two shots incapacitated him, but not before he began firing back at Larry, hitting the escaping inmate once in the hand, nearly quote-unquote blowing off his thumb, according to some reports. The gunfight lasted less than 30 seconds, but numerous shots had been fired, mostly into the ceiling of the bowling alley. The CO that Larry had initially struggled with lay bleeding on the floor of the bowling alley and would later find himself in critical condition. Thankfully, though, he would survive. Larry Chisholm began to make his escape from the bowling alley with the help of three inmates. Richard Lyons, a man serving a 50-year armed robbery sentence, as well as George Bonds and Floyd Brewer, who were each serving decades-long rape sentences. They gathered weapons from the four incapacitated or surrendered COs, who all carried 38 caliber pistols. The four escaping inmates then took a female employee of the bowling alley hostage, leading her outside at gunpoint. During this time period, it became clear to those in the bowling alley that Larry Chisholm had been the ringleader of this entire escape. The other three inmates he marshaled together and began barking orders at seemed to follow his command willingly and it was obvious to anyone in attendance that he had orchestrated the entire thing. One of the CEOs would later recall on America's Most Wanted, quote, It was a setup from the beginning, a planned out deal from the beginning. There was no backtalk. He did not have to ask them a second time. The four inmates made their way outside with their female hostage, a part-time Bull Arena employee. There, they carjacked a vehicle belonging to another employee of the bowling alley and began speeding towards the nearby Dixon Municipal Airport, which is where the next step in Larry's dastardly plan took place. There, Larry and the other three inmates freed their female hostage, but turned the sights of their weapons to the owner of the airport, who was a pilot himself. The man, whose young son was with him, was forced to quickly prepare his four-seat Cessna. The escaping inmates demanded the man fly them out of Tennessee into neighboring Arkansas, taking both him and his son hostage. Within minutes, the four inmates were in the air, along with the pilot and his son. However, the four-seat plane, which was already beyond its seating capacity, was not equipped for this type of flight. In addition, the flight had been unplanned and rushed, which meant that the pilot had not had time to make proper precautions or preparations. 
Shortly after crossing into Arkansas, the Cessna began to experience some mechanical issues and was forced to make an emergency landing on a dirt road in Mariana, Arkansas, which, conveniently, was just about 20 or so miles away from Forest City, where Larry had grown up. A farmer that witnessed the plane landing on his property rushed out in his black truck to offer his assistance, and was greeted by the four armed inmates, who immediately took him captive and stole his truck. He would eventually be freed without being harmed, just like the rest of their hostages but the inmates would use his truck to hasten their escape. Eventually, they split off into pairs, and Larry fled with Ronald Lyons, a man serving a 50-year sentence for armed robbery. Together, they would take an elderly couple hostage, whom they would eventually release, unharmed, in the backwoods of Kentucky. That was right after the two split up, and Larry found himself on his own. Larry made his escape on foot from there, more than 200 miles away from the bowling alley. Police theorized that he might have been trying to flee back to the area of his hometown, where it would have been easy for him to assimilate and hide among his loved ones. It was a real fear to investigators that this could prolong their search for days, weeks, or even months, as Larry was intimately familiar with this area, and had already likely been able to go to ground. Two of the inmates that had escaped with Larry, George Bonds and Floyd Brewer, had been captured just a day or so after their escape. They had split up from Larry and were only able to last a single day on their own. After being recaptured, they told police that Larry was likely headed towards Texas, and this tidbit of information led to a series of roadblocks and searches along the way, as police attempted to narrow in on Larry's location. That weekend, a man identified Larry Chisholm as a man that had asked him for a ride earlier that day and another woman reported seeing a similar man near her home in Calico Rock, Arkansas. Aided by federal agents, the regional and state police began closing in around Larry Chisholm, who had become desperate once again. He carjacked and kidnapped a local man, taking him as a hostage and using his truck in an attempt to flee. This truck was quickly located by police, who began converging on the location and engaged Larry in a high-speed chase through this rural area of Arkansas. During the chase, police began firing shots into the vehicle, with one of them grazing Larry in the head. Thankfully, nobody was hurt in the process, but the shots had their intended effect. The truck was forced off of the road after crashing into an impromptu roadblock set up by the police. Larry Chisholm had finally been detained and arrested, four days after orchestrating his escape from the Bull Arena in this neighboring state. His wounds were treated at the scene and he was soon booked into the Lenoke County Jail, where he was officially charged with kidnapping, theft, and a number of other crimes he had committed in the process of escaping custody. That September, Larry was indicted by a federal grand jury in the Middle District of Tennessee. He was indicted on five counts relating to his escape and plane hijacking, which was likely to result in decades being added on to his prison sentence. Two months later, in November of 1978, Larry Chisholm and two of his accomplices pled guilty to the charges filed against them. They were each given an additional 30 years in prison, meaning that Larry Chisholm, who had served roughly four years out of his original 40-year sentence, was looking at spending the rest of his life in either state or federal prison. While awaiting his sentence for this escape attempt, 29-year-old Larry Chisholm had recovered from his wounds, and within days, he was back to his old self. Once again, like a chameleon, he began to assimilate into his surroundings. This time, instead of it being a prison, it was the Lenoke County Jail. This is where he was awaiting further charges related to his escape attempt, which was sure to put him into another state-run institution. He had thrown away most of his goodwill in that endeavor, and was looking at spending the rest of his life behind bars. However, just like before, Larry Chisholm's outward appearance seemed to shield him from harsher scrutiny. He was a lanky, nerdy-looking, unassuming young man, who somehow looked both older and younger than his 29 years. On December 22nd, 1978, just three days after his 30th birthday, Larry Chisholm began acting out a second escape attempt. Just like the first from approximately three months prior, 
He conspired with three other inmates, including two from the previous attempt, George Bonds and Floyd Brewer. The four men were able to get their hands on a wrench, which they used to open up a air conditioning vent. They then crawled through this vent to a nearby room, which housed weapons and keys for the jailhouse. Now armed, and with keys to open up select doors, the four men were able to overpower a guard from a nearby room, stealing his car keys and sidearm and then locking him in a cell. They then made good on their escape, using the guard's 1977 Ford Thunderbird to speed away from the jail. No one noticed their escape for precious hours. By the end of the year, three out of the four inmates had been captured, but Larry Chisholm had yet to be found. While Larry's prison break accomplices were all eventually tracked down, he was somehow able to avoid capture. Police believed that he had fled to the area of Little Rock, Arkansas where he was able to blend into society under an assumed name. Investigators would eventually learn that Larry Chisholm had adopted a number of pseudonyms, some of which had likely been established by acquaintances of his prior to his escape. Some of Larry's friends, who might have been involved in his drug operation from earlier that decade, had helped procure fake identification cards, as well as supplies for him to live on for the first few weeks. The pseudonyms that he operated under included the following, Daniel Barry, George Rupert, Gary Buoni, as well as both George and Earl McLean. With these names, Larry was able to move around the country unimpeded, and his trail would go cold for several months after his second escape. Soon, it was theorized that Larry Chisholm could have helped finance his early travels by single-handedly robbing a bank the first national bank in Cincinnati, Ohio, to be exact. The robbery took place roughly one month after his escape, on January 26th, 1979, and involved a man who looked just like Larry. This man had entered the bank and pretended to be an official with the U.S. Treasury, who then, in private, claimed to have a bomb. This man then left the bank with roughly $250,000 in cash, never firing a shot or harming anyone. He blended into a nearby crowd and escaped unscathed. It was later believed that Larry had been the man behind that robbery, and despite never being officially charged or convicted in the case, he was indicted years later, in 1985, just one day before the statute of limitations expired. Some witnesses had identified him with mugshots, but since he has never stood trial for the crimes, it's hard to determine whether or not he was actually involved. The hunt to find Larry Chisholm had essentially grown cold by the summer of 1979, but police would later learn that he had found his way to New Orleans, Louisiana. That summer, he began working a series of manual labor jobs, such as roofing and siding, temporary gigs where his identity wasn't a pressing concern for employers. While living and working in New Orleans, he began rooming with a co-worker that he would become friendly with, named Jimmy Price. Eventually, he even started dating a local woman named Evelyn Wood, who would be one of the many women that Larry Chisholm would fool over the next several years. Evelyn had no idea what Larry's history was. In fact, she did not even know his real name. She only ever knew him as either George or Earl McLean not knowing that he was an escaped fugitive with active warrants from multiple states. After a short period of dating, the two moved in together, and in the latter half of 1979, Larry Chisholm would suffer a serious injury while working. Using the assumed surname McLean, Larry Chisholm had begun working a series of manual labor jobs, in addition to regular blood donations at a nearby plasma center. However, one day, when he was loading plywood onto a roof at one of his work sites, he slipped and fell two stories. Later that day, he was admitted to a nearby hospital in New Orleans, where he would spend the next several weeks recovering. Sadly, this hospital's records were destroyed decades later, in 2005 during Hurricane Katrina, so the specific details of this stay are not known. However, we do know that this injury derailed Larry's career at the time and ultimately led to his relationship with Evelyn souring. 
Right at the beginning of 1980, the two split up, with Evelyn finally learning about his true identity. Following the split, she moved in with some family members of hers, abandoning the apartment they had once shared. Larry then relocated to Mobile, Alabama, where his friend Jimmy had just moved to. There, he was able to find some more roofing work, and began to settle into another routine. However, he was not able to last in Mobile for very long, as Evelyn decided to speak to the FBI, giving them information about Larry and where he could be found. Somehow, though, Larry was able to evade the FBI, always remaining one step ahead as they struggled to ascertain his whereabouts. While living in Alabama, Larry Chisholm had worked another series of manual labor jobs. Everyone knew him under one of his aliases, and using his natural charm, Larry was able to obtain a number of girlfriends, whom he would stay or live with for very short periods of time. One of these girlfriends was a young woman named Linda Hicks, whom Larry had moved in with during the first half of 1980. At this point, Evelyn, his previous girlfriend, had turned on Larry and informed the FBI about his current whereabouts, but they were too late in capturing him. Roughly one month after Larry's most recent exodus, police were able to track down Linda Hicks. They brought her in for an interview, and asked her questions about her relationship with Larry, such as when she had last seen him, etc. The answers she provided were pretty illuminating, but did very little to help actually track down Larry. Linda Hicks told federal investigators that Larry Chisholm had been notified ahead of time that the FBI was looking for him. So Linda, who had a few children, made the decision to drop off her kids and flee the region with Larry. She had told her sister that they would be back in a few days, but the two hit the road, narrowly evading the FBI's searches. A search of the couple's trailer revealed that Larry Chisholm had been researching how to live as a fugitive including stockpiling the personal details of strangers to help create fake identities, as well as having information about setting up mail drops for supplies and other material he could not obtain as a fugitive. Police even learned that Larry had been calling the family members of deceased children in an attempt to learn about them, hoping to adopt the deceased child's identity and use their personal info to obtain birth certificates, social security numbers, etc. It was a pretty lengthy process, but it had helped him establish the fake identities he used on the run, many of which officials had not even caught up on. Following their disappearance from the region, Larry and Linda had fled to Magnolia Springs, Alabama, then turned their attention east towards Florida. Eventually, they decided to stop in Georgia, and then began heading north towards South Carolina. During this trip, they mostly slept in their car, but occasionally stopped in low-cost motels to rest and shower. They had not been able to run away with much in the way of cash, so they had to subsist off of odd jobs they could find at service stations, as well as a few stops they had made to blood donation centers. After about a week away from her children, Linda Hicks had decided to return home. Larry accompanied her for a bit, but decided not to return to Alabama. When she spoke to the FBI, Linda said that she had left Larry behind at a rest stop in Meridian, Mississippi, and had not seen or spoken to him since. This would be his last known location for about a decade. It wasn't until 1986 that Larry Chisholm's whereabouts became known to federal investigators once again. That was when one of his pseudonyms, Gregory Moser, relocated from West Virginia to Charlotte, North Carolina. The interim six years remain a mystery, for the most part. While living in Charlotte, Larry seems to have adopted yet another alias, the one that he would become most closely associated with, Kenneth Lamar Brookins. Under this name, he applied for a driver's license on September 29th, 1988, and listed his address as an apartment building on South Tryon Street in Charlotte. There, Larry is believed to have been living with a woman that went by the name Deborah Brookins. The two claimed to be married, and according to their names, they were. 
However, this mysterious woman was just as much an enigma as Larry was, with police today still not knowing her true identity. She had also gone by Sherry Moser prior to adopting this name. Living in Charlotte, the two seemed to have at least one daughter. However, they might have had up to three daughters, who went by the names Brenda, Barbie, and Sandy. Only one of the daughters was ever seen by multiple eyewitnesses. The eldest daughter, Brenda, who was described as looking a lot like Deborah and who might have attended school in the Charlotte area. But the existence of the two younger daughters has not been ruled out. Together, these daughters were believed to have some ties to Rock Hill, South Carolina, and they might have even been homeschooled. For a while, this family unit lived in a motel while Larry began looking for work in Charlotte. They began attending a local church, the Christians United for People Ministries, often abbreviated as CUP. And it was here that they reached out to obtain assistance with food and clothing as they tried to stand up on their own two feet. Minister Tom Johnson, who headed the ministry, claims that he met Larry Chisholm and his family in the first half of 1989, when he asked for some help for his family. From that point forward, Minister Johnson would become familiar with Larry, who he knew as Kenneth Brookins, as well as his wife, Deborah. He remembered Deborah having an eye problem despite not wearing glasses, as she always needed to hold reading material close to her face in order to make out the words. Minister Johnson says that this family often attended auctions and yard sales hosted by the church, and said that the Brookins had three daughters, the oldest of which, Brenda, had a speech problem. He said that the Cup Ministries helped provide YMCA memberships for the three girls the following year, 1990, and recalls the family being avid campers who spent a lot of time outdoors. During this time period, Minister Johnson says that Larry, again operating under the pseudonym Kenneth Brookins, often provided free or cheap carpet and handiwork service for the homes of Cup Ministry attendees. He seemed to have carpet-laying equipment of his own, which seemed to be how he earned his meager living. On at least one occasion, Minister Johnson had driven Larry's wife, the woman calling herself Deborah Brookins, home after service when the buses were not running. He says that the woman seemed guarded, never letting the minister see where she and her family lived. When he did drop her off, she asked him to drop her off near a somewhat busy intersection in a parking lot that was across the street from a housing development. The minister believed that they lived in a nearby duplex, but he could not be sure. Larry and his adopted family seemed to have settled into a quiet life in Charlotte, and he soon began to work for a home building company in Matthews, North Carolina. Deborah, his wife, had found a job closer to home at a laundromat slash bar with flexible hours. They eventually moved into an apartment building along Castleton Road and owned two vehicles. A white 1972 Ford, a fixer-upper that Larry had purchased from a co-worker, as well as a 1978 Chevy van which was primarily used by Deborah. Sheldon Lewis was one of Larry's co-workers and friends, who only knew him as Kenneth Brookins. The two became friendly during their time working together, but Sheldon never knew much about Larry. The other man never spoke much about his past, other than some vague statements in which he admitted to smuggling weed from Mexico with his friends years prior. This statement, which honestly wasn't too far away from the truth, did not really surprise Sheldon, as Larry, or Kenneth as he was now known, was a regular weed smoker who was growing plants of his own inside their apartment. Sheldon later told police that, on at least one occasion, Larry had expressed an interest in perhaps returning to Mexico. Sheldon had sold Larry the white 1972 Ford under the assumption that Larry would fix it up and resell it in the future. It was barely functional, so Sheldon ended up giving Larry rides to work on most workdays. He claims that in all of the interactions he had with Larry and his family, he only ever saw one daughter, the oldest daughter, Brenda whom he claims Larry helped out with homework almost every single night. Despite being one of Larry's closest friends in the Charlotte area, Sheldon was not able to provide much in the way of information about the family. He only ever knew Larry and his supposed wife as Kenneth and Deborah Brookins, and he was unable to confirm that they had more than one daughter. Additionally, he knew very little about Deborah, Larry's alleged wife, other than stating that she had brown hair, had an eye issue but did not wear glasses, 
and had some kind of familial connection to the state of Florida. That was where her mother and either her father or stepfather lived, but that was never quite clear. This life as Kenneth and Deborah Brookins seemed to suit Larry and the woman he was living with, and the two enjoyed a quiet, rather peaceful existence with the woman's children in Charlotte through the end of 1989. But on January 3rd, 1990, that was all flipped on its head. That Wednesday evening, Unsolved Mysteries aired a segment about Larry Chisholm's escape from prison over a decade prior, in December of 1978. Larry Chisholm, living as Kenneth Brookins, actually saw the episode as it aired, and seemed to realize that the life he had built for himself was about to come crashing down around him. In an effort to keep his freedom, Larry fled with his family. Together, they left behind almost everything besides the clothing on their back. Furniture, food, even an upcoming paycheck, which Larry had yet to collect. They left town in their 1978 van and never looked back. Right before leaving town, Larry had called a co-worker of his and told him that he had just seen his own story on Unsolved Mysteries. He said that he was leaving, but would be back in approximately three months to pick up his final paycheck. In the meantime, his co-worker could have everything else left behind in the home or at the workplace. Larry Chisholm would never return for that last paycheck, and seemed to leave behind the identity of Kenneth Brookins forever. He never contacted any of his other friends or acquaintances in Charlotte. In a single night, him and his entire family had just… disappeared. Investigators would only ever be able to pick up Larry's trail one final time in Atlanta, Georgia. He had been in Atlanta in December of 1990 roughly 11 months after his getaway from Charlotte, and police knew this because he had sold his van to another roofer in Atlanta, who had purchased the van for work. Unfortunately, this man would not register the vehicle for close to a year, so it wasn't until 1991 that police learned about this, close to two years after Larry Chisholm's last sighting in Charlotte. This last stop in Atlanta, Georgia on December 4th, 1990, would be Larry Chisholm's final known location. In the decades since, he has become a ghost, and has rightfully been one of America's most wanted men. Prior to his many escapes and escape attempts, Larry is believed to have planned everything out ahead of time. In his prison breaks, he is known to have had a network of friends outside of prison help in the preparation, knowing full well that simply escaping from jail wasn't enough to remain a free man. Escapees generally need a network of acquaintances to keep and maintain their freedom, especially if they want to continue existing in the same country they escaped from. Even when he was outside of prison, Larry Chisholm had been careful to plan out everything ahead of time. He had adopted numerous identities, using hours of careful research to craft each one, applying for and receiving official documentation with information he would manage to coax out of family members. Police discovered that he had done much of this legwork on his own, and even had with him a laminating machine which helped him forge authentic-looking ID cards. Many of Larry's accomplices would become known in the months and years after his escape with many facing criminal charges due to their involvement with, and or loyalty to, Larry Chisholm. Ronald Lyons was a convicted felon who had escaped from the Bull Arena in Dixon, Tennessee, alongside Larry in September of 1978. While Larry and the other two escaped inmates were eventually recaptured, Ronald managed to avoid being caught for over a year. When he was finally found and arrested out in Nevada, he claimed that he had had no further communication with Larry Chisholm, and he was not believed to have been involved in the subsequent escape attempt from December of 1978. William Hinson was another one of Larry's accomplices, who was perhaps his oldest and longest-lasting friend. The two had become friends while attending Memphis State University, and, following Larry's incarceration for creating a drug ring, had visited Larry in prison numerous times. Police would later learn that Hinson had helped conspire to break him out, planting the two sawed-off shotguns in the bowling alley, which Larry and his accomplices later used to shoot at numerous correctional officers and make their escape. For more than a decade, William Hinson also went on the lam, becoming a wanted fugitive for his involvement in the prison break plot. 
It wasn't until June of 1992 that he surrendered to the FBI, telling them that he had fled to Tucson, Arizona, where he had been living and hiding for nearly 13 years. He even alleged to have seen Larry in the interim decade, although the specific circumstances of these encounters are not publicly available. It is possible that Larry had gone west after fleeing Charlotte, North Carolina, but there are several years of Larry's life unaccounted for. Some of Larry's other friends from college were believed to have been involved in the planning of his escape from the bowling alley in September of 1978. But determining who knew what exactly beforehand would prove to be an almost impossible task. To date, many of the people that helped expedite Larry Chisholm's flight from custody have yet to be brought to justice, or even identified. Larry Porter Chisholm is still wanted by federal officials, with numerous outstanding warrants existing for his arrest. His trail became cold just days after his story was featured on Unsolved Mysteries in January of 1990, and other than a brief record of him being in Atlanta the following December, he has been in the wind for almost 30 years. Larry's case was forwarded to the U.S. Marshal Service in 1993, and they have been conducting extensive investigations into Larry's whereabouts and his past in the decades since. They continue to hunt for him today. And that is how I actually learned about the story. An unresolved listener, who works for the Marshal Service, got in touch with me to help highlight this incredibly unknown story, and I was more than happy to oblige. Larry Chisholm is believed to be alive and well today. He is known as a chameleon, a rather mundane, normal-looking guy that can blend into almost any environment. Physically, he stands around 5 feet 10 inches tall and once weighed around 160 pounds, with brown eyes and black hair that has likely grayed or whitened by now. He has scars on his left and right arms, and a noticeable birthmark on his left thigh. He has worn thick prescription glasses in the past, which contributed to his bookish appearance, but he may have adopted contacts in the years since. Chisholm doesn't talk much, but can blend into most conversations. Having spent his formative years in Arkansas and Tennessee, he seems to prefer the South, as the climate once allowed him to find regular work year-round. But he is also known to move around. Officials know that he has lived in numerous southern states, such as Tennessee, West Virginia, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida, and may have even hidden in plain sight in communities where he has friends or family. He also may have moved on to Mexico or another nation entirely, where he may have kept connections from his work in the drug trade. But if so, he has left behind no record of having done so. It is possible that Larry is still living with, and potentially married to, the woman he was last seen with who identified herself as Deborah Brookins, and who had previously used the social security number of a woman named Sherry Moser. She is a white female who stood around 5 feet 2 inches tall, had dirty blonde hair that might have been brown, and is believed today to be in her mid-60s, if not slightly older. She had an eye problem, but did not wear glasses, and had some kind of connection to the state of Florida. The woman calling herself Deborah and or Sherry had at least one daughter, a girl named Brenda who likely attended schools in North Carolina between 1988 and 1990. Brenda was believed to have been born in July of 1978, and went by the nicknames Brandy and or Pooh. It's possible that there were at least two other daughters living with Larry and his wife, who would have been named Barbie and Sandy. If any of this information sounds familiar, you are encouraged to reach out to the United States Marshal Service. Any tips can be called in to 1-877-926-8332, and you can even submit tips online at the following web address, www.usmarshals.gov slash tips. Once again, that's www.usmarshals.gov slash tips. To date, Larry Porter Chisholm has been the longest lasting fugitive on the USMS Most Wanted list. He is believed to still be alive today and would be in his early 70s if so. Until such a time that an update is warranted, his story remains unresolved.
thank you for listening to Unresolved. I owe a huge thank you to my friend Tim Fraley with the U.S. Marshal Service, who originally contacted me to cover this story a few months back. This episode would not have been possible without the hard work of Tim and his associates, in particular Victor, Adrian, and Rachel. I cannot thank them all enough for their help, and I hope that this episode helps lead to some awareness in this case. Maybe if we're lucky, even a tip or two. If you would like to learn more about this show, please make sure to visit the podcast website, unresolved.me. Once again, that's unresolved.me. There, you could find all of my sources for this episode, links to the podcast's social media pages, an email contact form, etc. Everything's there at the website. There, you could also find a link to the podcast Patreon page, where you can help support this show and get access to a variety of bonus material. Stuff like unresolved mini-episodes, commercial-free access to each episode, and my exclusive series available only on Patreon, Resolved. You can find all of that by heading to patreon.com slash unresolvedpod, or heading to the podcast website, unresolved.me, and clicking on the Patreon link at the top of the page. Before I go, I would like to thank all of the producers of the podcast, who support Unresolved each month through Patreon. These producers are... Maggie James, Ben Crocom, Roberta Jansen, Matthew Brock, Quill Carter, Peggy Ballarda, Evan White, Laura Hannon, Astrid Nyer, Catherine Vatalaro, Damian Moore, Amy Hampton Miller, Scott Meesey, Stephen Wilson, Scott Patzold, Kathy Marie, Marie Vangland, Lori Rodriguez, Emily McMeehan, Jessica Yount, Brian Rollins, and Ali Ibarra. Thank you all for listening, and I hope to be back with another new episode next weekend. Until then, everyone, stay safe, and I will talk to you later.